All right. Well, thank you very much for coming and thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about my, my research. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about some work uh, that I've been uh, doing over the past decade or so. Here you see a few examples on the left. You see a fluvial type environment slash continental shelf uh, evolving and their sea level cycles. Uh, in the center, you see a barrier island migrating towards land under constant sea level rise. And um, on the right, uh, that was on the center. And then on the right, um, I'm still thinking about what the one on the right represents. So if anyone has some ideas, come to talk to me afterwards. But um, so, but what has every, all these simulations have something in common is what we call a moving boundary approach. And they combine an idealized geometry with uh, sediment conservation or, or mass balance. This is, of course, the uh, product of um, a lot of uh, effort from students listed here. I'll um, talk about them through, throughout the presentation, as well as many collaborators. Um, so the plan for today's talk is to give you uh, three examples of how, we, how these uh, moving boundary frameworks can be used to address specific scientific questions. And over a wide range of uh, temporal and spatial time scales, um, which I believe that is aligned with the theme of, of the annual meeting. So I'm gonna start with glacial cycles, uh, fluvial attack environments and continental shells uh, over those time scales, then barrier islands, uh, barrier island evolution over millennia. And then um, uh, in time scales of uh, years to centuries, we have to take into account what human development and human activities um, uh, how do they affect the landscape evolution? So let's just start with part one. And I'm going to uh, frame this moving boundary framework uh, around the question, do the dynamics of the fluvial surface play a role in paleo level reconstructions? So the first step is to idealize the geometry. So we have a linear basement on top of which we have sediment and water that come down and deposit forming the sedimentary prism which is delimited by the alluvial bedrock transition in the upstream end and the shoreline in the downstream. So the trajectories of these uh, key geomorphic boundaries are going to determine what the evolution of the sedimentary prism is, is over time uh, um, um, is, right? So, and, and just for context, um, the most common approach to reconstruct sea level um, is, is sequence stratigraphy, which assumes that the fluvial surface or top set response instantaneously to sea level changes. So if there are stratigraphic indicators in the upper portion of the fluvial surface, those are going to be contemporaneous according to sequence stratigraphy to sea level changes. So idealized geometry combined with a sediment transport formulation, which we assume that is just a, a simple relationship uh, between sediment uh, flux and, and the local slope um, and uh, sediment conservation in one dimension because we have just a profile. So what you get is um, uh, 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 a closed uh, set of equations. This is uh, an example of a simulation it takes less than a minute to run. And uh, what you are looking at here is the evolution of the sedimentary prism. Uh, the sediment supply is again coming from the upstream end. The evolution of the sedimentary prism over time and the sea level cycles, the sea level curve is shown here in the uh, upper right. Uh, so the change in colors you can Think about it as uh, the age of the position. So there are two points I want to um, emphasize about this model simu simulation. One is the changes in curvat curvature and relief of the fluvial surface. So during sea level rise, you have a lot of ac uh, accumulation of sediments in the near shore portion that flattens the profile and makes the uh, profile convex. And then uh, during sea level fall, what you have is a lot of a bypass uh, that builds the delta front. Uh, and shifts the profile from convex to con concave. And then the second point that I want to, uh, to highlight is, is if you, hopefully you can see that if you look at what is happening in the upstream location uh, and what is happening uh, to the sea level variations, hopefully you can see that it's not in sync. Um, uh, there are lags geologically, long leaf uh, lags in the upper portion of the fluvial surface. Um, and that, basically is at odds with uh, sequence stratigraphy, what I mentioned before. So this is, of course, a, a theoretical result. Uh, we need to validate this, and I would be interested to talk to 
uh, uh, any of you about how to validate it with the field uh, with field data, but we started with Flume experiments from Tulane University. So you see here a plan view of uh, the sedimentary prism. Here you have an inlet in the upper uh, left corner where the semen and the water is coming in. And the sea level curve in this case is this panel um, uh, panel B, right? So uh, you have uh, low amplitude sea level cycles and then high amplitude sea level cycles. We analyzed the entire thing, but I'm gonna talk about only the high amplitude section uh, here uh, in the interest of time. And what we did because um, is basically take the radial average because we are interested to know whether this near shore location here in light gray responds instantaneously to sea level variations or not. And the same question for the upper location in the up, up, upstream location, right? We don't want um, other uh, processes like river avulsions or um, uh, meandering of the, of the river to of, of the channel to to affect the patterns of erosion or deposition. We are interested in the elevation changes uh, on average at these two uh, locations, um, uh, the near shore and the upper location. So here is the highlight right of this slide because here what you can see is the elevation residuals over time, um, and the thin uh, black line is the sea level curve. And then you can see that the near shore location in light gray is actually following uh, quite nicely the uh, sea level variations. But the green line, which is the upper location, the upstream location is actually completely uh, out of sync. Um, so you actually can have river incision. You can have erosion in the upper portion of the fluvial surface during the sea level rise phases. Uh, so in the in experiment days, two meters by two meters, you can actually see um, lags in the response of the upper portion of the fluvial surface, um, which basically supports the theoretical results. And still there is a lot of work to do um, uh, connecting the numeric, the theoretical work and the numeric uh, and, the, and, the, and the experiments. But um, it's, um, we cannot take, we, I think that here the message is that we might want, be, we might want to be cautious when looking at stratigraphic ind indicators of the upper portion of the fluvial surface. Uh, it might not be con um, uh, contemporaneous uh, with the sea level variations. Okay, so part two, uh, barrier evolution, barrier self-deposits. Um, barrier self-deposits are often associated with uh, sudden changes in external forcing, like for example, a sudden change in the a pulse in the rate of the sea level, in, in sea level rise. And, um, and, and Dan uh, was interested in this question. So he did a lot of uh, literature review, looking at barrier self deposits in different continental shelves. And he found that there is actually a characteristic uh, distance between these barrier self deposits. If you are in the English Channel, it's in the order of two kilometers. If, if you are in Florida, it's in the order of seven kilometers. So, this basically suggests that there might be something else going on apart from uh, yes, pulses in the rate of sea level rise. And to address this question, um, um, uh, Dan used uh, uh, an existing uh, barrier model uh, that um, Silke Tass explained actually really well before. Um, and basically it's a, uh, assuming a linear surface, the superior portion of the barrier is characterized by the um, average height and the average width. And the key geomorphic boundaries here in this case are the surface toe, the shoreline, and the back barrier face. So we can express, and I don't have equations here, but happy to talk about it. The, uh, the uh, change in the location of these geomorphic boundaries is a function of the leading processes, the rate of sea level rise, the exchange of sediments between the upper and the lower surface, and overwash uh, fluxes, which basically bring sediments from the front of the barrier and deposit it on top and the back. That's what allows the barrier to migrate towards land and keep pace with sea level. So what Dan found is that with this model, he could to first order explain uh, not, all the, not only the characteristic space in between barrier self-deposits, but also some degree the volume of sediments uh, in different locations around the world, New Jersey, Florida, uh, Long Island, uh, English Channel, South Africa, Italy. So, and one of the things that he learned is that um, a key, one of the key controls is the, the slope of the shelf. So if you have a, a miles um, a shelf, you're going to um, have a, a larger characteristic spacing 
um, and um, larger volumes um, of barrier self deposits. And uh, so again, like with the same spirit and previous uh, example, this is not really um, uh, answering all the questions about this problem. There is still a lot of the work to do, but it suggests that we might want to be careful uh, associating uh, all barrier self deposits with a change in, in, in um, external forcing. All right. So, and last part of my talk is um, associated with uh, changes in um, with time scales from years to centuries. So, here um, you can see in this picture an engineer viewing in a New Jersey, a seven meters tall, to 21 feet high, right? Um, so, it's a massive future, right? And th this is going to play a role in the way that the barrier islands and Long Beach Island responds over these time scales. So the question here is whether we can actually separate the uh, effect of uh, human activities and um, from natural processes. And to do that, what we do is look at Long, Long Beach Island over the last couple hundred years. Um, and um, using a couple uh, numerical modeling and, and mapping effort, right? Um, and during this time period, Long Beach Island has transitioned from uh, an undeveloped barrier system, a barrier Mars Lagoon system, to uh, completely developed, fully developed, right? And just to give you an idea of what uh, an undeveloped barrier island looks like, here I include an example of Cedar Island in 1984. Here in red now is the shoreline at that point in time. If uh, in 2016, <clears throat> the barrier has rolled over itself a few times. It's, migrating towards land at a rate of uh, approximately 10 meters per year. Um, that is in contrast with what uh, Long Beach Island uh, has done over the past few decades has been fixed in place. And here, what you see is uh, an example of a beach nourishment episode. That's why the shoreline is protruding into the ocean. Um, this much. And this, what looks a small now in this picture, these are the uh, seven, seven meter tall dunes that you saw in the previous slide. So these are actually uh, very significant volumes of sand that are added. Um, so to, to address this question, we basically added a few key geomorphic boundaries to the framework before. We now have them, uh, Mars platforms in the back. Um, so we have, in addition to the ocean shoreline, the uh, back barrier shoreline, the, we have also the Mars lagoon edges and the uh, inland uh, Mars edge as well. All right, so um, I don't include equations here, but um, it's uh, the key message here is that uh, the evolution of Long Beach Island roughly can be separated in two phases. One phase, phase one, during uh, in which you have all the geomorphic boundaries migrating towards land, as you might expect from from a barrier Mars lagoon system under sea level rise. So you have the shoreline uh, eroding, 170 meters. Um, uh, the Mars back barrier Mars is actually expanding into the, lag to the lagoon thanks to the overwash fluxes also that uh, provide mineral inputs to, to the Mars environment. And the inland Mars is eroding on the lagoon side, but is uh, expanding also towards mainland, maintaining more or less the, the width of the Mars platform. But this, this situation completely reverses in phase two where you have the shoreline prograding to the ocean during this time period due to coastal engineering, beach management practices, hard structures. And the Mars platforms are eroding on both sides of the lagoon. And they not only don't expand towards mainland, but they actually lose area due to development. So, so hopefully these type of exercises can help us to also look at the scenarios in which we don't have uh, these landscapes fixed in place, but we actually have a mix of the relative effect of natural processes respect to human activities increases. So then we it's good to have that benchmark. How were barriers behaving before they were uh, fully developed, right? So I provided three um, examples of that hopefully illustrate how uh, moving this moving boundary framework approach can be used to address uh, uh, questions over a wide range of uh, temporal scales. And another key point I want to make is that they seem to be very targeted to, to address a very specific question, but they are also 
um, not they can be extended. Um, they are versatile and portable, so they can be extended to address other questions. So I include a couple of examples here. Um, so this profile model that I showed before, um, you can connect it via Longshore and include inlets. So that's basically what the app did. And, and that's the simulation that here you see in the top, uh, in the bottom left, right? So you see this in plan view barrier islands migrating towards land with inlets and with um, coupled by a Longshore same and transport. Um, in the case of uh, the fluvial tech uh, last continental self uh, environment, we, we are extended to account for more complex same and transport formulations that include the threshold of motion, for example, and that allows us to account for the evolution also of the Sapecos portion of the, of the fluvial tech environment. And I was half joking before uh, this uh, is basically also to illustrate that uh, the same numerical technique that we use here is called the enthalpy method. We can actually uh, extend it to two dimensions very easily. And, um, but of course, it's not physically meaningful at the moment because it, it doesn't have channels. You would expect channels to incise at some point during the sea level cycles, right? And, uh, but it, it also you know, illustrates how we can couple with other models using the CSDMS platform. Um, and with that, I'm gonna stop it there. We have time for one or two questions. Yeah, cool talk. Um, you probably guessed which part of the presentation I wanted to ask a question about. Um, <laughs> the second part, I was wondering when you see these um, barrier islands migrating uh, over time, there's a little bit of platform remaining. Um, what What is that and how is it different from whatever is underneath it? There is a little bit of uh, platform. Um, yeah, it had like a slightly different color in the figure that you showed. Um, in this uh, slide yeah. in the model? Okay. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So yeah, there is an alternation between uh, the position and ravine surfaces, erosional surfaces. And I uh, changed the color uh, because I'm assuming that the basement on top of which the barrier is migrating is, uh, um, is basically rock and the barrier is leaving sa sand behind as it migrates toward land. Um, so that's why you see this is like contrast between the dark brown and the and the more yellowish color. Yeah. yeah good Thanks. question. Is there any oh Nicole has a question from really cool talk. Um, I'm wondering about when you went when you illustrated sort of that the deposits and the locations were ne not necessarily in sync with sea level um, changes. When you go to 2D, I guess I would expect it to be more complex. And you didn't really talk about that. Um, you just kind of showed this little video, but I guess, is there, it just looks very, um, symmetric, I, are you getting the same kind of dynamics that you're getting when you do the 1D profiles or is there something that's maybe missing from the 2D besides the channel you said, like, I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good question. And that gives me the opportunity to, to also mention that even though we don't have channels, we can actually use numerical models, uh, uh, laboratory experiments also to, you, to validate this 2D version at least under constant slow rise scenarios when you have mostly seed flow. Um, so, uh, and actually I've been playing with that. So it seems like we are not missing anything uh, much apart from channels. Channels is really what would give you the asymmetry, I think. Um, and we can capture the angle, opening angle uh, from experiments with this, uh, with this uh, modeling framework, even though it actually has only one parameter really to, to calibrate. So we are actually thinking that, that, that this is um, at least, so channels is the key point that we need to add, but 
do we see also the river incision in the upper portion of the fluvial surface and there's still uh, variations and the answer is yes. And from the modeling point of view, it's actually not surprising because it's after all diffusion, right? right? So, um, but the magnitude um, is actually even larger in a 2D uh, model because you have uh, uh, the, it widens, right? So the reason why you have river incision in the, in the upper portion is because you create accommodation in the near shore portion. Now, if you have a wider fluvial surface in a 2D model, the space that you have to fill with sediments from the upper upstream, for the, from the upper portion is larger, right? So you have even more erosion in order to be able to fill that space under the changes in relief and curvature. So hopefully I didn't uh, so we need it too much. That but. middle video, that cross section somehow from the right, because it's really hard to. Yeah, I mean, it must, if the middle video, how you have the cross sections and the timing with sea level rise and fall, I'm trying to like envision that for the, the movie on the right and it must be so complicated, so yeah. Yeah, and, and we actually have it. I probably should have had a bonus slide to include that, sorry, but. It's okay. Um, Great talk, thank you. Thank you.